I'm grateful to all of you who are watching or listening for your interest in Carmelite tradition. And before we ponder Carmel's charism, I suggest that we lift up in prayer all those who are suffering from COVID-19 and their families asking that Jesus the healer touch them with his merciful and healing hand. As the 13th century was getting underway, two institutions uh, came into existence, the university and mendicant orders, and they have interacted with each other ever since. A fruit of that relationship is the endowed chair and center for Carmelite studies at the Catholic University of America. A generous gift to the university by the Carmelite province of the most pure heart of Mary has been reciprocated by the warm hospitality extended by the university to Carmel. The endowed chair and center are a unique gift to all who cherish Carmel's wisdom, a wisdom to be shared with everyone and anyone who seeks wide guidance about the journey to God. I dedicate this lecture to the eminent historian and insightful poet of the Carmelite order, Father Joachim Smet, who died in 2011. And to all Carmelites everywhere and all friends of Carmel, I have been deeply enriched by Carmel's family of nuns, sisters, friars, and fellow lay Carmelites. As assistant uh, general of the Carmelite order, Joachim Smet arranged, albeit without my knowledge, that I be assigned to study under Dom David Knowles, uh, a Benedictine, an acclaimed expert in monasticism and mysticism. Dom David had a very special fondness for Teresa of Jesus and John of the Cross. In his last letter to me before he died, Dom David wrote this, I am more sure than ever that prayer of the heart and soul is the first work of a religious, prayer that is love. Dom David's sentiment <clears throat> is germane to the theme of this lecture. Carmel's Charism. During this lecture, I shall omit citations and detailed arguments that uh, are in the printed text, but uh, aren't necessary for speaking to you this way. Uh, if yours is a tradition other than Carmel, the main thrust of this paper is applicable to those of other traditions. For example, what makes a Holy Cross brother a Holy Cross brother? What makes a Jesuit a Jesuit? What makes anyone listen to the Holy Spirit and make one's way to the Father? This is not the first time that I've explored Carmelite identity. In 1978, I was invited to join a small group of scholars who met during a conference at York University in Toronto. The topic of that conference was consciousness and group identification in high medieval religion. My lecture was entitled The Search for Identity by Medieval Carmelites, 1200 to 1326. The group at this uh, meeting consisted of the Dominican, Leonard Boyle, the Benedictine, Dom Jean Leclerc, Professors Giles Constable, Bernard McGinn, Carolyn Walker Binham, Richard Snyder, and myself. Research on my paper was, to be honest, disconcerting. Sources for my topic were in short supply. Many of Carmel's medieval texts were as yet unidentified, unedited, or unexplored. 43 years later, the story is very different. Now, numerous sources are available, expertly edited and professionally explored by Carmelite scholars too numerous to uh, list here. 
but they, these scholars, have made more reachable a satisfying response to the question, what makes a Carmelite a Carmelite? The Second Vatican Council. Vatican II was the most significant religious event of the 20th century. Its teacher, teachings offer an authentic presentation of the Catholic tradition, including its wisdom about consecrated life. On October 28, 1965, some 12 days before the council concluded its deliberations, St. Paul VI promulgated the decree perfecte caritatis of perfect love. Perfect, not in the sense of something that was without any imperfections, rather perfect in that one does all that one can do with God's help. This decree directed religious communities to undertake, and I quote, an update, uh, updated renewal of the religious life that comprises, comprises both a constant return to the sources of Christian life in general and to the primitive inspiration of the institutes and their adaptation to the changed conditions of the time. The council sent religious back to the sources of their community's identity and on a mission to retrieve their original charism and to become adept at reading the signs of the times. Since then, untold hours of research, countless meetings, books and articles have ensued as religious across the globe have explored their identity. Like other orders and congregations, the Carmelites have spent the last 55 years since the council in a personal and communal search for identity. From identity to charism. St. Teresa of Jesus could be, if you had not noticed, loquacious. Yet, she could also be quite concise. This doctor of the church described Carmelite identity in a nutshell. I quote her, all of us who wear this holy habit of Carmel are called to prayer and contemplation. Carmel's identity includes more than prayer and contemplation, yet nothing is more important to a Carmelite than prayer and contemplation. In 2002, Carmelites celebrated the 550th anniversary of the papal document Cum Nula. This document welcomed women for the first time in uh, the 15th century, for the first time as full-fledged members of the Carmelite order, and which also approved the existence of the Carmelite third order. At the time of that anniversary, St. John Paul II, who had a very unique affinity for Carmel, wrote this, I quote, Carmel is where prayer becomes life, and life flourishes in prayer. No matter how concise a Carmelite charism becomes, it must never omit prayer and contemplation. The achievement of an authentic identity, whether personal or communal, is a sign of maturity. We live in an intensely conscious age that is focused on the search for identity, an era ushered in by Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Later, the psychoanalyst Eric Erickson stressed that a mature identity is alive, not inert, dynamic, not static. And Erickson suggested that seekers of an authentic identity ask two questions. What do I have to work with, one? And two, what do I want to make of myself or ourselves? From a Christian perspective, the first question is about gift, specifically 
gift as grace. The second question concerns freedom. Grace and freedom are fundamental to Christian identity. My approach this afternoon is not psychological, for that I'm entirely unprepared, but in any case, it will do no good to enlist psychology since the first century of Carmel's existence. Almost nothing is known about the personalities of the Carmelites of that era. But that lack does not excuse one from trying to discover the authentic identity of medieval Carmelite hermits and friars in whatever way we can get that knowledge. Their achievements and their struggles to live in allegiance to Jesus Christ are what the Carmelite rule bids them to become. This, dedicated followers of Jesus Christ and what John of the Cross suggests comes first in the ascent of Mount Carmel. And I quote, to have, this is John of the Cross, to have an habitual desire to imitate Christ in all your deeds and to behave in all events as he would. That's the bedrock of Carmelite spirituality. My perspective is historical and theological. Historical because Carmel has learned the hard way that it must accept and work for factual accuracy. Contemporary society is awash with wildly concocted fantasies that has robbed our culture of trust in authority, in the church and in society, and even in those with whom we live and work. Trust makes possible serenity and hope. Carmel for too long was addicted to the fantasy that the order had its origin in 9th century BC with the prophet Elijah as the historical founder. Much ink, much talk, much anger in fact, was expended on something that should have been let go of. This claim arose when Carmelites with no known founder were faced with founders like Benedict or Francis of Assisi the latter a universally admired founder who captured the imagination of the people of his time and ever since. All the while, Carmelites had to deal with the pain of anonymous beginnings. Carmel's response to this anonymity to, was to weave a mythic and legendary origin. This wishful thinking or lack of thinking eventually created problems once this false identity was critiqued by the Bolandists, a Jesuit undertaken and initiated in the 17th century. These Bolandists were dedicated to stringent historical research as they wrote their lives of the saints. Their principal achievement is the Octa Sanctorum, the Acts of the Saints. The Carmelites for too long resisted the scholarship of the Bolandis, wasting time and energy on their claim that Elijah was their historical founder. Finally, during the second half of the 20th century, Carmelite scholars, by the rigor of their scholarship, have made amends, albeit indirectly, for their mistreatment of the Bolandis who had exposed the untrustworthy character of Carmelite legends about their origins. In our day, Carmelite scholars endorse and imitate the unflinching rigor of Bolandist scholarship. No more demands that the writings of the Bolandist be uh, placed on the index. No more, and for these are for the older Carmelites, no more second nocturnes that is, lives of the saints that are composed of fantasies. Carmel, as an intentional faith community, must abide by rigorous theological reflection as they endeavor to articulate an authentic charism. The Christian identity of the human person or of a human group 
is a deeply religious reality. For Christians, human existence is of divine origin and has a divine destiny. Because they are a faith community, Carmelites do well to explore their identity, not only historically, but additionally from the perspective of charism, but always with the conviction that a charism presupposes and demands rigorous historical scholarship. The notion of charism, we, it often seems as if it's been around forever, but that's not so. It was the uh, Second Vatican Council uh, that articulated that a charism is a divine gift in Lumen Gentium number 43, and in Perfecte Caritatis of perfect love, describes religious life as lived, and I quote, under the impulse of love, which the Holy Spirit pours into their hearts. Uh, all of us then are reminded of Romans 5, 5. A charism is a free gift of the Holy Spirit for the building up of the body of Christ. The Czech Cardinal Tomas Spidlik says that charisms reveal the dynamic presence of the Holy Spirit. And if we're honest, we must admit that we may have used the name in the past, Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, but we knew little about it, the Holy Spirit because we didn't pay attention to the gifts of charism and the Holy Spirit as we hear about the Holy Spirit in the, from the fathers of the church. The charism of a religious community is not some inert thing, not an advertising slogan. Rather, a charism is the active presence and dynamic activity of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul reminded the Philippians, for it is God who is at work in you. One cannot live the charism of one's life unless one is capable of listening carefully to the Holy Spirit. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the Holy Spirit comes down and remains in the purified hearts of the baptized. <clears throat> The consecrated life intensifies, or the sacrament of matrimony, intensifies the experience of the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. As St. John of the Cross reminded his readers, the Holy Spirit is the chief agent, principal guide, and mover of souls. The Holy Spirit uh, and now I move on from that quote, the Holy Spirit inspires, guides, and enlivens the activity within members of a religious community or of any baptized Christian. Nothing, nothing is more dynamic than the Holy Spirit who is love. And love, as St. Paul says, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. Christian tradition imagines the guidance of the Holy Spirit this way, that the Holy Spirit is like a gentle breeze moving and guiding the sails of those who have been gifted by a charism. If you could capture the notion there, it's a mystery. And in the tradition, we've been trying to imagine what, how that mystery uh, unfolds in our lives. And the, the people with the symbolic tradition in the Middle Ages thought of it as each person is a kind of a sailboat being moved along by the Holy Spirit. In our own time, Yves Congar uses the following imagery for his charism. Yves Congar was a, a main architect of 
a Vatican II. And in the introduction to his three volumes on the Holy Spirit, Father Kungar says this, each one of us has his own gifts, his own means, and his own vocation. Mine are as a Christian who prays, and as a theologian who reads a great number of books and takes many notes. May I therefore be allowed to sing my own song. The spirit is breath. I would like then, says Father Congar, to be an Aeolian harp and let the breath of God make the strings of my life vibrate and sing. Uh, the Aeolian harp was a box with a hole in the top, as you know, and strings. You put it on your uh, windowsill and let the breeze play individual tones, unique tones coming to you. And he imagined that to be his inspiration. He led a marvelous life. He was a prisoner of war. He spent his last uh, decade in the hospital uh, uh, because he had uh, been injured during, that, uh, during the war. Uh, but he became the authority on many uh, gifts and, uh, uh, that he had, and especially on the Holy Spirit. Prayer and meditation sensitize one to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. As St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us, mutual love brings about mutual presence in one and in the other. Uh, one listens carefully to Aquinas. He is saying that love brings about the presence of God in the other whom we love and the other's love for us within us. So that love, genuine friendship, brings about a mutual sacrament, uh, not with an official sacrament to the church, but the manifestation of God's love in our lives. The Holy Spirit as love urges those who live the Spirit's charism to work, and this is important always for us, that the Holy Spirit, its charism, his charism, is to work on behalf of the common good. We're not holy for our own sake. We're holy because we have sisters and brothers who need our witness to goodness, truth, and beauty. A charism is not a descriptive statement composed by a community or by some uh, historian or theologian, no matter how illustrious she or he may be. The Carmelite charism, we describe it as the gifted activity of the Holy Spirit in a Carmelite community and in those who live that charism. Statements clear and authentic about a charism are important as a guide that alerts one to the presence and stirrings of the Holy Spirit. But the charism itself are not the words about it. It is the actual divine presence of the Holy Spirit. This is new for us if we pay attention to it because we left the Holy Spirit almost as if it was a bi binary God rather than a, a trinary God. In class, I tell students, such and such will be on the exam. Then they sit up, get the pen out, and write it down. Uh, that statement brings attention. So may I suggest that what I say now will be on the exam. And this is what I want to say. Remember what we've learned, that the interpretation of Scripture is incomplete until that skip, Scripture, the good news, is lived. Until it becomes, as Father Roland Murphy used to say, it's actual in your life. So too, a charism is incomplete, unfinished, until it is lived. Jesus taught whose neighbor uh, was with a, with a parable. So he told the lawyer who asked about who his neighbor was, Jesus says to him, 
go and do likewise. That is, go and live what you have just heard, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The freely given gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit calls for gratitude. Best expressed by living that gift. Since a charism is a gift of the Holy Spirit's self, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. I want to pause to ponder the nature of gift. A gift is a gift when it is freely given. And a gift is a gift when it's freely received. And to give or receive a, a gift is risky. If you give it, it may not be uh, uh, welcomed, it may not be used, it may be set aside, it may be ignored. And if we do not welcome the gift, then it has been wasted on us. Reciprocity between giver and receiver in gifting, giving is crucial. The Holy Spirit, who is the love between the Father and the Son, gives freely of the Holy Spirit's self. That's the gift. The gift is the Holy Spirit, not something that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's very self, giving of oneself. That gift achieves fullness when the Spirit is freely received. That is, when one freely and devotedly lives the Spirit-filled life. What's that Spirit-filled life like? Do we, do we know? We know, yes, because Jesus knew well what the life of the Spirit looks like. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a spirit-filled life. St. Paul gives a glimpse of a spirit-led life once we receive that charism and live it with his hymn to love. Love is patient. Love is kind. And each one of us can recite the rest of those lines. We've heard them over and over again. They're not supposed to be just admired as a great hymn, but as a gift to be lived. Paul has more to say in Galatians 5.22 about what happens in a Holy Spirit-led life. Says Paul, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And oh, how our times could welcome those gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of a spirit who is trying to move us to the good, the true, and the beautiful. To live a life of law, love, is the challenge for a Carmelite community, for any community, for any marriage, for any friendship. Possible because God expects only that we do what we can with God's help. God will do the rest. We can be confident in that. In 1971, St. Paul VI, and I must remember uh, St. Paul uh, because I was at a meeting in Rome in 1968 and we went out to, to the summer at Gandolfo to, to hear a talk by the Pope and he uh, embraced us and gave us a book to take with us. But in an ex exhortation, uh, and I quote, on the renewal of religious life, according to the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. This is uh, St. Paul VI work. It focused the attention of religious community on their founder's charism and affirmed, and this was the first time it was kind of put in those direct terms, 
people presumed that, but this was the Pope specifically speaking about the founder's charism. And he affirmed that the charism of religious life is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pope Francis, in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, said this, a sure sign of the authenticity of a charism is its ecclesial character, its ability to be integrated harmoniously into the life of God's holy people for the good of all, the common good, that is. The Carmelite charism, all charism, urges action on behalf of the common good, uh, rather than, as Saint Pope Francis has spoken, of the virus of radical individualism. And he suggests, uh, in, in this regard, uh, the working for the common good. And as we'll see, uh, he wants us to think about returning to a gift that, that was important to the religious orders of the Middle Ages, uh, fraternity. I'll come back to that. To be sure, a charism is more complex than what is contained in a brief statement. That's quoting a Carmelite scholar, warning us, be careful that, that you can't just kind of get yourself down to a few words, and then that makes your whole life. <clears throat> but we can say this, that the rules of religious communities are and this was the imagery of the Middle Ages, an abbreviated gospel. So statements about charisms are a synopsis of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I would use this imagery, that wonderful prologue of John's gospel is an abbreviated version of the whole gospel. So in talking about charisms, we're trying to uh, uh, offer ourselves something that will stretch our minds and our hearts so we'll see that that gift can be unwrapped and it keeps unwrapping uh, like a Russian doll. Briefer statements about a charism are necessary to inform prospective members of a community what is central to a, com a community's identity. And the Carmelites uh, got into that in the, in the very beginning by a little uh, phrase from what we call the rubrica prima, the first paragraph of their uh, constitutions uh, that reminded the uh, younger people in the order, it says, uh, what their lives were about. Carmel makes such brief statements to remind the young and the more seasoned Carmelites what is essential in answering the question what makes a Carmelite a Carmelite? And it, uh, I was careful in preparing uh, the flyer that went out with uh, Brother Darrell uh, that I insisted on the question mark because I didn't have the answers really. Um, but it's good to ask the question. The Jesuit Ladislas Orsi says this, and I used to write it down, put it on a paper and pass it out to my students. Blessed are those who ask questions. And I frequently offered them the possibility that instead of answering a question in the exam, they could write an appropriate question or questions, and I would accept that. Nobody ever did. So I don't know whether I frightened them, whatever it was. Back to the sources. Carl, Carmel's charism cannot not afford to become an abstraction, not a pretty phrase, not another piece of jargon that conveys little of the depth and the beauty of the Carmelite tradition. Scholars and practitioners of Carmel's charism must demand the same rigorous historical research that what we say about Carmel's identity, the, the, what the work of the historians do are uh, of the order, who are so devoted to tracking down the truth because it'll make you free. 
the presence and the activity of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. So we must find ways of imagining something that is light years beyond human intelligence. But scriptures, study, and prayer bring one hints, or as T.S. Eliot would say, hints and guesses of what love and wisdom is, because to love in a wise and loving way is to love the gift that the Holy Spirit has given us. We are well advised to turn to historical sources with penetrating questions in order to shed all superficiality. So to help us understand Carmel's identity and charism, I turn to the French movement known as Ressourcement. Uh, if, if you translate that into English, it's back to the sources. Theologians like Yves Congar, the Dominican, and Henri de Lubac, the Jesuit, had, a, had scholarship that had a huge and uh, profound impact on the Second Vatican Council. They are the major architects of that council. And the poet, Charles Peggy, was an, enamored by this movement of ressourcement. And um, he says in the, some of his comments, what Ray, going back to the, the, uh, the sources and reading them in a, with questions from our own time brings about a new and a fresh life and brings especially stimulating energy. If you remember, energy is the word that Eastern Christians use for grace. Race or mom tends one, sends one to, uh, uh, to the past with contemporary issues and problems. Rigorous race or small ensures that human intelligence does all that it can do to bring the Catholic tradition into dialogue with the modern world. And if we're not in dialogue with the modern world, we live in fantasy. Congar has written that ressourcement is not a simple return to the past. Rather, he says, today's questions of the ancient texts are something more and more central to our lives. He says, and in fact, Resource Mont should bring us to recentering our whole lives, minds, and hearts on Christ and on the Paschal mystery of the dying and rising of Christ. This movement demands critical historical research about faith in order to uncover fresh understandings of a past that has wisdom for the present and the future. That's Kungar. We don't want to give our young people tired out phrases that don't speak to them. We need to speak to their experience. For the Carmelite tradition, Resource Mount entails a thorough exploration of Carmel's classics. A classic is any person, event, or text that has an excess of meaning, an overflow of wisdom. So you can't listen once to Mozart's piano concerto and then you're finished with it. Rather, we must go back over and over with fresh eyes and fresh questions to, to let the tradition speak to us. The tradition, to hand over, the Latin word that gives us tradition means to hand over. And our past is trying to hand over to us the gifts, but we have to dig for the truth. For the Carmelite tradition, Race towards Mon entails a thorough exploration of the classics so that we may discover the riches of Carmel's charism when one engages wholeheartedly with the classics. For instance, the Carmelite rule, Ribot's institution of the first monks, 
the texts of Teresa of Jesus, those of John of the Cross, Therese's story of a soul, the writings of Titus Bronsma and Edith Stein, and on and on. But let me add this, it's time to bring on the poets. Those of you on the older side will remember that that phrase comes from a song, uh, bring on the clowns. Well, the bring on the clowns was that the, what was happening was not of any worth, bring the clowns on and at least they'll make us laugh. The poets will make us, uh, uh, the, I was at a conference many years ago at Kalamazoo in which a group of um, Cistercians were having a meeting. I came out of my meeting and ran into one of the monks from the Gethsemane and said to him, uh, what's that grin about? Oh, he said, I, we were talking about uh, how hard it is for communities to deal with their poets. I said, that wasn't just anybody, was it? No, he said, I'll admit, I was talking about uh, Thomas Merton. Um, that it, it is time to bring on the poets because they have a gift, a native gift for continuing to search for wisdom, however long and hard and deep they must search. And they have a gift of expressing that wisdom. One of the uh, receivers of the of a, a, a great prize in the literature uh, used to say, if you want to know how to read and write, listen to poetry. Raisa Maratain, wife of Jacques Maratain, believes that poets travel a similar path to those who pray contemplatively. Something like T.S. Eliot's description, and this is important for con contemplative prayer on exam, um, uh, that the poet, the artist, is like the uh, woman at prayer who prays by listening, by waiting to receive the gift. And I'll use Eliot's words for describing uh, what uh, he has to say about this. And as you know, T.S. Eliot, read John of the Cross avidly. I said to my soul, be still and wait without love for, and wait without hope. But hope would be for the wrong thing. For love would be love of the wrong thing. And yet there's faith, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, you are not ready for thought. And this is transformation. So darkness shall be the light and stillness the dancing. Contemplative prayer, art and poetry are all about transformation, that we become the people uh, to whom God, the Holy Spirit, has given the gifts that bring about who we are and who we can be. There are Carmelites whose poetry arises out of their gift for, of, of prayer. Poets like John of the Cross and Jessica Powers. And Edith Stein wrote about this, if you remember, uh, that the, the artist uh, is a gifted uh, person and sacramental in a way. These poets, including people like John of the Cross and Jessica Powers, have an uncanny gift to access wisdom about faith and the journey to God. So I say to myself often, turn to your shelf or the, the poet's uh, shelf. And so I say to you and to me, bring on the poets. An evolutionary charism. A founder's charism has an afterlife. Remember the charism of the founder, the, the original founder, the, 
or as it is with the Carmelites, a, a, a group and, and their uh, ecclesiastical uh, authority. I'll come back to that. <clears throat> a founder's charism possesses an inner wisdom that becomes explicit in time. Since Vatican II, the focus by religious communities has been on the charism of their founders. Good, good, that's great. But we've left something out. The charism is not, as I said before, not a relic, not something inert. We need also to ponder the afterlife of that original charism. John Henry Newman's an essay on the development of Christian doctrine prompted me to explore the giftedness of Carmel's charism. Ian Kerr, an eminent scholar in matters Newman, considered his essay as certainly Newman's, Newman's most famous and seminal work of theology. Written but unfinished in 1845, the year that Newman became a Catholic. Newman's book had an enormous impact on modern Catholic theology and on Vatican II. His essay is a report of Newman's growing search and conviction that Roman Catholicism is a faithful continuation of the, teachers of the teachings of the apostles and of the fathers of the church. Newman's essay reveals him walking, and this is his phrase, walking with the curious eyes of a boy through the apostolic and patristic writings, coming to the conviction that the teachings of Roman Catholicism are an authentic development of those teachings from the early church. Newman's essay makes one think that the teachings of the early church are like seeds that grow unfold and flower in the Catholic doctrine of later centuries. Newman's insight into the development of Christian doctrine has suggested to me that a founder's charism grows, unfolds, and flowers as seeds do. When Cardinal Newman reflects on the history of doctrine, he uses the word development, and he does that consistently. Now I've turned, and I hope that I'm doing right by this, I would like to use the word evolution. And I do that explicitly because I think that we have to show uh, that uh, faith, theology, respects science, and science needs to respect theology, and theology has to do the work that earns that uh, that. Um, respect. The evolution of a founder's charism is an analog, something like Newman's unfolding of Christian doctrine. The Jesuit Roger Haight says, and I quote, if our world is evolutionary, and this comes from the end of a book in which that's what he has said throughout the book, we have to incorporate its reality into our faith vision. We can say then, I think, that a founder's charism evolves, becomes energized, has new flowerings uh, as it lives uh, in time. And it's very important to being able to understand the cha changes that come in a religious community. Newman's conviction that Catholicism is the same religion as that preached by the apostles came to him through a rigorous review of texts from the tradition that convinced him to forego his Anglican commitment and to embrace the Catholic tradition. An accumulation, and I'm quoting, of faithful developments convinced Newman to enter the Catholic Church on October 9, 1845. The teachings of the Catholic Church, a faith community, evolved, developed, if you will, from the apostolic uh, era, even to what looked like it was radical in the Second Vatican Council, when the council affirmed the goodness, the truth, the wisdom of uh, religious freedom. 
Newman's memorable words, I think, will, will give us something to hang on to as we try to deal with changing religious communities that change through their reading the signs of the times and being faithful to the founder's original charism. And this is Newman. A great idea changes in order to remain the same. In a higher world, it is otherwise. But here below, to live is to change. And to be perfect is to have changed often. Carmel's original charism changed radically not long after the hermits on Mount Carmel arrived in Europe. How did it stay faithful to the founders' charism? What I have to say about identity and charism may sound as if they are two separate realities. The difference between charism and uh, identity or charism uh, in uh, asking the question, uh, who are we? Uh, let me enlist Thomas Aquinas, who is well known for asserting that grace respects nature, that grace lifts up nature, it perfects nature. Historical research, human reasoning, makes use of human reason and the gift of grace. Together, baptismal grace brings to one the presence of the activity of the Holy Spirit that works with human intelligence, which is a gift of, from God. I think an illustration of this is a night when the siblings of Therese of Lisieux, doctor of the church, one evening, they were distraught, her siblings, that she might die overnight without the ministry of a priest. She assured her anxious sisters, she, the uneducated Therese, who didn't even do well in school when they sent her down the street to school, she went to another school, Carmel. Therese's response to her anxious sisters was without a doubt, it is a great grace to receive the sacraments. But when God doesn't allow, it's good, just the same. And that famous phrase, everything is grace, to a gross. It's all gift. With no theological training, Therese knew that nature and grace are partners, that identity and charism work in tandem. We can say Therese had an instinct that everything that is, is good and true and beautiful. You will remember that I said when I began that I knew that I would uh, leave out certain citations and carefully, I think carefully, argumented, uh, given arguments for what I was saying. Um, but, uh, and I also intended to, uh, in the, in the, it's in the written text, that uh, what I've been talking about, I apply to the Carmelites. When they came from uh, the Holy Land, their beloved Holy Land, how hard it was for them to leave the Holy Land. They, were, they loved the Holy Land. Uh, their forebears, or they themselves, uh, emigrated to the, the Holy Land, and they left vestiges of that in Carmelite writings well into the 14th century. When they faced the question that, that came to them after they arrived in Europe, and they arrived in Europe uh, when the, after the uh, Battle of uh, Hatton, uh, when Saladin with his troops uh, uh, drove the uh, Westerners along to a, a little sliver of land along the Mediterranean coast. The hermits left for um, uh, Europe because the, their country there was unsettled, turbulent. 
Um, and let me uh, uh, explore this just quickly. Uh, and I moved to the early 1990s. Father Joachim had just thanked me for an essay I wrote in a festschrift in his honor. However, and he quietly, ever so gently, as was Joachim's want, he added this. I don't agree that the changes to the rule in 1247 led to a mendicant identity. Actually, and we kidded each other about this for years, even up to just before he died, uh, jo actually Joachim and I were not that far apart. It is a matter of emphasis. His conviction was that the Carmelites only slowly moved to mendicancy and not totally until 1326, when the Pope, Pope, Paul, uh, Pope John XXII gave them the privileges that Dominicans and Friscan, San Franciscans had. These were privileges to be confessors and, and uh, preachers in their diocese. If, if you ever get the chance to read the uh, written text, it will go on to uh, speak to the issue, how did the Carmelites make this uh, transition? Sometimes it's painted as if it was a matter of survival. They either become friars, mendicants with an apostolate, uh, or they'll have no future. Rather, I think they were enamored by how Francis and Dominic had gathered around them um, the uh, men in great numbers. Uh, they, they, they couldn't build uh, convents, and convents were places for men in those days. They couldn't build convents fast enough to house the Dominicans and Franciscans. But they, uh, out of the 12th century upheavals, had a, 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 an energy that to bring to the reading of the Gospels. Uh, and that they were, and as Dominic Chenu, the great Dominican, has said, here was an evangelical awakening. The word evangelical is unfortunately taken over for political use. The true evangelicals in the 13th century and should be now are the religious who bring the gospel to life by living the gospel. I have to, to close two suggestions, proposals to make. Number one, There is still much thought to be given to the transformation of hermits to Carmelite friars. I want to suggest that there be conferences on an ongoing basis that explore the mendicant life, exchanges among Dominicans, Franciscans, Axinian friars, and Carmelites, as uh, Chaucer called them, the Orders Four. Yes, there were rivalries among the medieval mendicants, but by far there were many more important friendships and exchanges, and I think that should continue now. In the uh, 1960s, in particular 1968, I was part of a small group in that went to Washington, D.C. and tried to start that. We had one conference and never again. I I'm interested in what it means for friars to belong to a student order. That is an order that invites its members to be lifelong earners, especially of the Bible, encouraged from the novitiate on to the end of their lives to be get it, committed to knowing Christ and him crucified. So I'm recommending that, that mendicant orders begin to exchange uh, uh, and not be in isolated processes that see them as an individual. The relationships are too important and they need to be renewed. I've also long felt that religious communities are meant to explore and to witness and experiment with what it means to be church, to be the body of Christ. We need witnesses to that calling. So I recommend that Christians become acquainted with a religious order, a congregation of women or men, get to know the charism of this or that community. These charisms will inspire you to know Christ and how to be in kinship with the members of a congregation as they too struggle to know and to love Christ. In leaving, I want to say thank you for listening and watching.
be well, be as joyful as you can be in these hard times, the mark of a committed Christian, says St. Luke. And I'll close with these words from T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you for listening.